I am very excited to be able to introduce Alicia's recital. Uh, becoming a conductor is a journey for all of us, and you become, uh, in many ways, you're a voice teacher, you're a music theorist, you're a historian, you're a conductor. There's just so much that's, uh, that's wrapped into it. We're very excited to hear Alicia's presentation on the spiritual as it pertains to the soprano and alto voices, and we're so excited to get to have a live ensemble here with us to make this happen. Thank you very much, Pete. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite uh, to the podium Alicia. One quick uh, comment about the format. Lots of recitals are just musicking all the time. This format is entitled Lecture Recital. So it will be about half informational and about half musical. So I hope that you enjoyed. Alicia, we're very proud of you. Can't wait to hear what you've been working on. Good afternoon. I would like to, one, thank you all for attending my lecture recital. The teaching of singing has changed throughout the years due to researchers and dedicated teachers developing new approaches to choral methods. Singing can encourage young people to express their emotions to the world in a secure environment. The art form helps build confidence and self-esteem. Prior to preparing an ensemble, the teacher conductor must equip the students with the history the music genre they are learning. This will help them understand and acknowledge context in which it was created. The performance of spirituals requires that the singers are equipped with brief historical context of the spiritual and the proper performance practice. From here, they should develop a deeper understanding of the raw emotions the spiritual arrangers embedded in the arrangements. This presentation will focus on the brief historical context, the development of the spiritual performance considerations, and other arrangers who have and are continuing to preserve the spiritual. In the late 18th century, the African American spirituals, musical form arose in the southern part of the United States, drawing inspiration from the music of West Africa, where many of the slaves who were later brought to the New World originated. Before we can understand the slave songs as we have come to know them in the 20th and the 21st century, we must first understand the origins and characteristics of West African music. In West African society, the concept of monotheism, or the belief in one single God, had become firmly established. The early 18th century missionaries discovered that many sections of Africa were already familiar with the Bible and its stories, and that they had even incorporated them into their folklore. When you take a deeper look at the importance of music in West Africa culture, you will see that it was an important and functional component of African life. Rather than an abstract form, music was used to communicate key life events, like births, marriages, funerals, and even the most mundane of daily routines. Music was provided to workers, to assist them in performing routine duties. Music was also used to communicate news and gossip, mock individuals in positions of authority, and express dissatisfaction with employers and others in position of authority within the government. Even children's daily lives were also accompanied by music. When they used to play games, and engage in various forms of entertainment. It is said, you can say publicly in song what you cannot say privately to a man's face. So this is one of the ways African society maintains spirituality, healthy community. 
Also in West African society, Gurits were highly trained musicians who were experts in a variety of subjects, including storytelling, poetry, genealogy, religion, and political and social norms. Individuals from this group, who were typically men, but not excluding women, memorized and passed down the oral histories of their people through song. Music sharing is another slave song trait that is shared with West African song and was vital to the very structure and fabric of the traditional culture, in addition to the preservation of stories and tales. Now, the call and response. Style of singing is the most popular type of musical sharing because it provides a very spontaneous and unplanned sense of choral song. The call and response is a musical form that is common in African American spirituals, such as probably one of the most well-known examples would be Jester Harrison's arrangement of Amen and Brazil Denard's Fair Ye Well. The call and response can be thought of as a musical conversation between multiple participants. The caller or the leader acts as a guide for the musicians starting the song and facilitating its development. The caller sets the tone throughout the performance, pushing and pulling on energy of the participants. This, the responders follow the leader with set lyrics. This form allows for maximum participation. When used in worship, in the African-American spiritual tradition, the caller is usually the preacher or other community leaders, while the congregation acts as the responder. Now the strength and drive of African music is derived from the manner that African musicians play toward the beat in West African song. Rather than following the beat, the African musician pushes the beat and give it greater energy. The song, strong beats of the West African music occur on beats two and four instead of beats one and three in Western music, which is now widely accepted. In African music, scales of four to seven steps were used to build melodies. Now we move on to the development of the spiritual. The spiritual arose when slaves were captured from their homeland, brought to these unfamiliar lands. These American Negro spirituals are the product of the fusion of Christian piety and the slave experience of persons of African descent. Alan Locke designated the antebellum decades beginning about 1830 as the classic period of the compositions of these songs. Over time, as slaves learned English and became acquainted with the tents of Christianity, they began to sing in the new language and to incorporate elements of both the old and New Testament religion in their songs. Negro spirituals tell the story of African Americans who were a part of just this horrendous struggle. There is such a significance for spirituals. These spirituals are the early form of communication. Now, what we consider texting, slaves had no other choice but to communicate amongst themselves. In Africa, again, all information was sung between villages, births, deaths, and the current events, and information given. These songs that we know as spirituals held secret meanings and biblical reference. Code names. Here are a few frequent code names. Canaan, Canada, the drinking board the Big Dipper and the North Star, the Freedom Train, the Gospel Train, 
the Underground Railroad, heaven, again, Canada and freedom. Moses, Harriet Tubman, the Promised Land, freedom, the River of Jordan, the Ohio River. Shepherds, people who encouraged slaves to escape and ex escorted them. Now that we have come to understand briefly the development of the spiritual, it is without question the spiritual transform to art music. Although Dvorak studied numerous genres of folk music and hymn while in America, he concluded the Negro spiritual was the only real folk music in America. Thanks to Harry T. Burley, born in Erie, Pennsylvania on December 2nd, 1866, he is an important figure in the history of American art song. Having written more than 200 compositions in the genre throughout his life, his performance compositions and his adaptations of African-American spirituals. He was the first African-American composer to receive widespread praise. For the first time, Burlick turned these traditional slave tunes into art songs. In addition to the Fifth Jubilee singers, Burleigh's choral arrangements were sought after by groups like 16 Voice Williams, the Walker Glee Club, Orpheus Club in Philadelphia, and the International Singers in New York, as well as 200 and 300 voice choirs that were also popular. A typical approach today, Burleigh structured the same spiritual in many voices to fulfill the needs of various ensembles. The next group also played a part in transforming spirituals, the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Fisk University it was an American liberal arts college for young men and women, which established in Nashville, Tennessee in 1866. Due to the school's financial difficulties five years later, it had to close its doors. Now to raise money, the Fisk, the Fisk University a treasurer and music professor, George L. White, formed a nine-member choral group and took them on a tour. On the morning of October 6, 1871, the group dispersed. Jubilee Day is now observed every year on October 6 to honor this occasion. During an early Cincinnati concert, $50 was raised which was sent to the victims of the Chicago fire in 1871. The kids were physically and emotionally exhausted when they arrived in Columbus. That following year on tour, Mr. White gave them the name, the Jubilee Singers, as a sign of optimism and encouragement. A nod to year of Jubilee in Leviticus 25 and 25. People began to rethink their minds after hearing these great voices. Standing ovations and glowing reviews eventually replaced the heartening hardship. They gradually, with sufficient wealth to meet their living expenses and return to Fish University. 11, 11 members were added to the ensemble in 1873, and they visited Europe for the first time. Negro spirituals were preserved thanks to the efforts of the original Jubilee singers. Now, there are five types of spirituals. One, the work songs. Now, these songs were tunes while they worked out in the field. Andre Thomas, Going Up Glory, and Stacy Gibbs, Hold On, are examples work songs. Now, the shouts and the hollers. These spirituals were used as instructional material, which is a component of the ring shout tradition. 
The spiritual Ezekiel saw the wheel is a well-known example of this style of spiritual. Ring shouts were a type of song from the southern Tidewater region that used African rhythms and chants performed with a shuffling movement as dance was not allowed. Examples of this type of, of religious expression are rare today. In Chesapeake Bay region, the singing and praying man keeps their traditions of ring shouts alive by bringing together members of several congregations. On the coast of South Carolina and Georgia, where a dialect of African English called Gullah was spoken, is another place where some of these early songs have been preserved. The McIntosh County Singers is another group that continues to this day to perform ring shots. Now, our religious spirituals. These are the preaching and teaching spirituals that directly connects the pictures of King Jesus, the Judgment Day, and Heaven. Some examples are Brazil Denar, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian, and Stacy Gibbs, Old Time Religion. Now, our escaped spirituals. Spirituals that are coded, or as we say, navigation. These spirituals are named as such because the words and the lyrics make it very evident that they are preparing to flee. These spirituals are keep your lamps, the drinking board, and wade in the water, to just name a few. Now we move to our freedom spirituals. These spirituals refer to Moses, the Hebrews, and the Israelites as deliverers. The spirituals go down Moses, great day, are spirituals that talk about earthly freedom. Now to our performance considerations. Using dialect. Dialect is the language of our predecessors that have been passed down from generations to generations. James Weldon Johnson states that the Negro dialect in America is the result of effort of the slave to establish a medium of communication between himself and his master. The use of dialect in African language songs is majority based on the purpose of the target audience. There are three classes of dialect that musicians consider when composing their songs. The African dialect is commonly employed in the 20th century for the ability to bring the authenticity of the African language or the accent. There are phonetics that are available in the American language, but African language did not exist. By the time you come, but an African said, by the time you come. Again, there are other dialects, such as Standard English, which comes out respectively and easy to understand standard. Majority use in family songs or sometimes in some upbeat gospel songs. We have the hyper approach that intends to soften and sweeten the songs by mostly using the local language, the dialect. The TH sound in that can be softened to a D sound, but there are no firm laws of dialect. The TH sound, again, did not exist in African language. Tempo and the rhythm is another form of performance consideration. The tempo of a song can be used to show feeling of the song in the attended time for the song. Tempo can be exciting, which is fast, calming, slow, and many other feelings. Changing the speed 
of the song might make the purpose of the spiritual lose its meaning. Songs that slaves used to sing coming from the hard work of the day used to be slow tempo to match the rhythm of their tiredness in their walking. Therefore, understanding the African song spiritual rhythm and tempo involves understanding the slaves' feelings. Now to vocal timber and color. Timber and color are two factors incorporated in the African dialect to bring out the authenticity of the song and to relate again to their feelings, connecting the idioms Spirituals and understanding the times of the song make it easy to reach the right voice of singing that slave song. In the 18th and 19th century, spirituals were the most impactful factors to understanding the vocals of a slave song. Now we move to early spiritual arrangers who have played a factor in the American, African-American spiritual. John Rosman Johnson. John Rosman Johnson was born 1873 in Jacksonville, Florida. He later enrolled in New England Conservatory of Music, studying piano, organ, composition, and voice. In that same year, he went to London for additional training. He began his teachership in Jacksonville Public Schools, where he later became the supervisor of music for Jacksonville Public Schools. James Rosman Johnson and his brother, James Weldon Johnson, is known for writing the text and music to lift every voice and sing, known as the Negro National Anthem. Now, Robert Nathaniel Dent. He was born in Ontario, Canada on October 11, 1882. In 1908, Dent received his BM degree, winning five Beta Kappa honors. In 1932, he completed a Master's of Music degree at Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. Dent's most important work began in 1913 at the Hampton Institute in Hampton, Virginia. He trained the choir at the traditionally African-American school to a new level of musical excellence. His 40 boys Hampton singers performed at Carnegie Hall in January of 1914. Dent rose to the position of director of music at Hampton in 1926, the first African American to hold that job. In that same year, he was awarded Doctor of Music degree. Again, another first for an African American. He died in 1943 while serving as core advisor for the United States organization and touring with a woman's choir in Battle Creek, Michigan. Now we move to the middle period arrangers. Moses Hogan, born March 13, 1957 in New Orleans, Louisiana. Moses Hogan has had an exceptional contribution to the Negro spirituals. He furthered his studies at Old Berlin Conservatory of Music in Ohio, where he obtained his music degree. He did not end there. As he furthered his study in New York's Juilliard School of Music and Vienna, Austria. You might recall, this is where Beethoven also came to study to be a classical music composer. He then later returned to Louisiana State, where he began his music career as a conductor and arranger. He was well known for his arrangements of Negro spirituals, it is the same passion that drove him in the late 90s to establish the Moses Hogan Chorale and Moses Hogan Singers. On February 11, 2003, we lost Moses Hogan to a brain tumor that claimed his life. 
Moses Hogan honors his upbringing in the African American Baptist Church, where his uncle served as the choir director, and this is where Moses Hogan learned and heard many spirituals during his younger years. He was interested in the a cappella setting of the spirituals, where he worked to preserve the melody and the meaning. His arrangements reflect a combination of his classical upbringing and Baptist training. Now, to the beloved Brazil Wayne Denard. His real music education started in the church. He states, I grew up hearing church choirs sing anthems and spirituals. Socially, the church was the only place black people could perform. They weren't allowed in the great concert halls of this country. Born on January 1st, 1929, in Detroit, Michigan, prior to the Great Depression, he was two generations removed from slavery. He was a significant contributor in the preservation and revitalization of the spiritual musical form. He attended Detroit public schools, he was taught at a young age how to play the piano, where he studied with Johnny Reed and Professor S.A. Rapper. Brazil moved his studies from piano to voice. He dreamed of a professional career as a tenor, but he soon realized that opportunities for black males in the classical world were limited. He told Detroit Free Press, I decided that if I couldn't work as a singer, I will prepare others who someday would. Brazil was the core director at Detroit Northwestern High School, where he served as the head of the Fine Arts Department for Detroit Public Schools for many years. He skillfully prepared his ensembles to earn superior ratings at state festivals. In 1972, the Brazil de Nar Chorale was formed it is a group of highly trained singers dedicated to developing the core art to its highest professional level and still in existence today. I would like for the director, Ms. Alice Tillman, to stand, who is the director of the Brazil Denar Corral. As well, we have other members here as well. July 5th of 2010 at the age of 81. His professional affiliations were, just to name a few, the National Endowment of Arts, Music Advisory Committee for the Michigan Council for the Arts, and President of the National Association of Negro Musicians Incorporated, NAM. Now, we move to the performance part of this segment. Dr. Rosephine Powell is currently a professor of voice at Auburn University. Dr. Powell teaches applied voice, art song, and literature, and vocal pedagogy. We will now sing her arrangement of Somebody's Knocking at Your Door.
masterpiece is Let Me Fly, arranged by Dr. Mark Buck. I had the privilege of serving under his tutelage at the Florida A&M University. He is a composer, conductor, educator, pianist, and a baritone. Mr. Butler received his undergraduate degree of music education from Florida and the University. He holds a MFE, Music Masters of Education degree from Florida State University, and a DMA in choral conducting from the American Conservatory of Music in Hammond, Indiana.
Stacy Gibbs. He is currently in residence at University of Connecticut. He serves as a clinician nationally and internationally for universities, high school, and professionals, and church choral organizations. He attended Kentucky State University, where he served as student conductor. The St Mr. Stacy Gibbs, choral debut, debuted July 2016. He was a management professional with 20 years of experience. His music has been programmed at all state festivals, national associations of music education.
thank you for attending my master recital. The African American spiritual is a broad, broad spectrum that just could not fit in a one hour uh, segment. So hopefully the information that I gave you will help you in your further careers in music, will help you in the classroom, and even if you even learn something new. Again, I would like to thank my faculty committee, Dr. Brandon Johnson, Professor Catherine Rohr, and he could not be here today, Dr. Robert Peeble. Also, I would like to thank my former high school director, Ms. Sheila Sykes. Would you please stand? Thank you again and have a good day.